Hi guys and welcome to our revision sessions and today we are looking at reproduction. Before we start any lesson guys, we always need to know what it is that we need to learn in the section. We're not going to waste a lot of time here, we're just going to go through this list very quickly. You must be able to do the following. Compare asexual and sexual reproduction. You must know the differences. You must be able to describe and draw diagrams to show the life cycles of flowering plants and the moss to show alternation of generation. You must also be able to describe the life cycles of some insects. You must be able to draw label diagrams of a flower to show the structure and function of each part, especially in the process of sexual reproduction. You must also be able to discuss the adaptations of South African plants for reproduction. In other words, you must know uh, the adaptations of plants, but you must use South African plants as examples when you're explaining that, because we want to learn about our country. Then, lastly, you must also describe the diversity of reproductive strategies in animals. That's the last of that section. Let's get straight into the questions, guys. We are looking at something from November 2011. This is on page 2, question 1.5. The question says, study the diagrams of the structures of two flowers below. The magnification of each flower is indicated in brackets. Here's the flowers. There's one flower there, flower A. Here's the second flower, flower B. This one here is magnified 20 times, and this one is magnified 0 0.5 times. So all this information, including the top plus the diagrams, is absolutely crucial in answering this question. The first one is easy. Provide labels for C, D, and E. And as usual, we will do that on the diagram. Label C is pointing to this part here just outside the flower or rather part of the flower on the outer layer. And that is obviously the petal or the whole thing together is called the corolla. The next label is D and that's this structure here. And this part is called the anther. And the last label here, this part here, is called the stigma. So C was the petal or corolla, D the anther, and E the stigma. Which flower, 1.2, which flower, A or B, now notice they're telling you in brackets what they want. Your answer must be either A or B, that's all you need to write here, is probably pollinated by insects. They're not talking about other flowers, they're talking about these two flowers, A and B. We have to look at the structure of A and the structure of B. Look at the structure of A, uh, of A first. There are no petals. There's no corolla here in this diagram. So obviously it wouldn't be brightly uh, colored, etc. Also look at the anthers. They are very big and they are sticking out. They are much higher. In this one here, you're finding that there is a petal and corolla. You cannot see the color in this diagram, but there is a petal or corolla in this diagram. So if they want to know which one is insect pollinated, well, we would have to go with the answer being B. And I have explained why in my little discussion of these diagrams. B has petals. The fact that it has petals and A does not have petals, that will tell you, and we know that insects are attracted by brightly colored petals and so on. And also look, another thing you can see is that the stamens and the pistil are lower down in the flower. And this is very typical of insect pollinated flowers because it forces the insect to go inside for the nectar and therefore making sure that pollen can brush off onto the legs. The next one says, which flower or flowers, A or B, actual size is greater? We have to go back to the diagram again. Here's diagram A, that's the size of the flower, and that's the size of the flower of B. They are, this one, on face value, looks bigger than that one, obviously. 
But look at the magnification here. This flower is magnified 20 times, whereas flower B is only magnified 0 0.5 times. Now, if they are more or less the same size, with A being slightly bigger than B, but B is only magnified 0 0.5 times, and this is 20 times, which is four times more the actual size, then obviously we have to go, in this case, with B again. So B's actual size is greater. That covers us on a question on flower. We move on to question two which is based on the diagram of the following page represents the life cycle of a butterfly. Remember, these questions are taking, or rather taken, from a question paper. So you would see they're talking of another page and so on. But obviously, in our case, the screen is right in front of us. Okay, so they're giving us a diagram. There's one, two, three, four. Name the type of metamorphosis shown in this diagram. Explain your answer. Let's go back to the diagram first. This would be the organism itself. On this leaf, we can see some eggs. Here we're seeing a caterpillar. And here we're seeing a form of a cocoon of sorts. And then we're seeing the adult coming up there again. And that's how the life cycle continues. So what type of metamorphosis is this? The answer is, this is complete metamorphosis. Does your answer end there? No. Explain your answer. And how do we explain the answer? Uh, this organism undergoes all four stages of development. And these are, I showed you there, the eggs, egg. Then we saw the caterpillar, that would be the larva, the cocoon-like structure, the pupa, and then the adult. So this organism undergoes all these four stages. And when an organism goes through all four of these stages, we say that complete metamorphosis has taken place. If any one of these is missing, then we'd say that it's incomplete metamorphosis. We still continue with the question. Label the stages numbered one to four. We discussed it earlier, so it should be easier now. One is obviously the adult. Two, this adult is laying eggs in this case. So there's the eggs. This is the caterpillar, so this will be the larva. This one here is the pupa. So in other words, what's happening here, guys? The adult lays eggs. The eggs hatch to form the larva. And look in this case, that the larva stage and the adult stage are totally different from each other. The fact that they are different from each other is already clue that this is complete metamorphosis. And the larva then develops into a pupa. And out of this pupa comes out a beautiful butterfly in this case here. Look at this, the, 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 the difference in uh, characteristics between the adult and the larva. So that covers us there. Explain the major difference between complete and incomplete metamorphosis. What is the difference between complete and incomplete? Now, in my explanation earlier, I have alluded to that already. So what is the main difference? In complete metamorphosis, the organism undergoes all four stages of development. And incomplete is when in the life cycle one 
stage is missing. That would be the major difference. Also, incomplete is actually incomplete there. Incomplete when the life in the life cycle one stage is missing. Another thing you can say is that the in incomplete the larval stage, or rather, let's just take that out there. The hatchling, the organism that hatched the hatchling, resembles. The adult. It will obviously be smaller. And in the case of a locust, for example, what can happen is that it looks like the adult, but it may lack wings. So it cannot fly at that stage. We call it the hopper. So that's the main differences between complete and incomplete metamorphosis. And with that, guys, We'll give you a small break so that you can refresh and get yourself geared up for what comes next. Welcome back, guys. I'm hoping you took the little break that you have to revitalize yourself so that you can concentrate again and get into this section. Remember, reproduction is a big section in paper two, so you need to know it well. And we're going through piece by piece here with the questions that are representative of smaller sections in uh, the syllabus itself. So let's move on with question three. Question three is adapted from exemplar 2011, paper two. They say, study the diagram of a life cycle of a plant, they're not giving you the name of the plant, in which the gametophyte generation is dominant. They're giving you a clue that this plant that we are talking about, the gametophyte generation is dominant. And there's the life cycle. They've given you the gametophyte there. Another clue is given in this diagram that it is reproducing by means of spores. They say male sex organ, female sex organ, N, which is haploid, cell division takes place, the male gamete, the female gamete, then come together in this process here. A zygote is formed. That's another clue in the diagram. From there, the sporophyte develops. The sporophyte undergoes cell division, and from there, spores come out. So let's look at the questions quickly. Is this the life cycle represented that of a moss or a flowering plant. Now, as I told you, as we read, there were some important clues. In the initial introduction, the first clue was the gametophyte generation is dominant. The second clue was given to you in a form that there are spores. And if you know your work well, guys, then you would know that the flowering plants do not reproduce by spores. They reproduce by means of seeds, one. So that's already not the flowering plant. Also, in the flowering plant, the sporophyte generation is dominant. So therefore, our answer would have to be, it is that of the moss. Name the following, cell division A. Here's the story. Yeah? Look at the, follow the diagram. Male sex organ N, female sex organ N, male gamete N, female gamete N. So what happened here? The chromosome number did not change. It was not reduced. So what type of cell division that is that going to be? Obviously, that's mitosis. Not your ptosis, mitosis. They want to know what is process B. Ah, this is easy, guys. Here's a male gamete. Here's a female gamete. They are coming together. And that process has to be fertilization. Cell division C. Now let's be careful here. What has happened here? Here's N, here's N. They came together to form the zygote. And the zygote would have to be 2N because N plus N, 2N. So the zygote was 2N. The sporophyte would be 2N. Cell division here resulted in the 2 becoming N again. So this cell division, obviously reduction division, 
Therefore, it is meiosis in that case there. I'm hoping we're together, guys. Simple stuff. We're still with this question. Is the gametophyte haploid or diploid? Ah, it was given to you guys. Here's the gametophyte here. From there came N, N, N. And if it is giving you N, then your answer has to be haploid. Remember, N is haploid, 2N diploid. Are seeds produced during the life cycle of this plant? Let's go back to the life cycle. Now, you didn't need to be a rocket scientist to answer this question. Here's the life cycle given to you on the screen. Were seeds mentioned anywhere on this diagram? Not at all. So your answer would obviously be a straight, flat no. Good, guys. That brings us to a conclusion of question three. We now move on to question four. Just remember, though, that you have to go through the life cycles. Many learners, uh, they decide on their own that those life cycles, they don't ever test. Remember, it can be tested. They can even ask you to explain the life cycles of the different organisms. So don't take it for granted that life cycles are not being tested. They can be tested. It is in the exam examination guideline, so therefore it is testable. Whatever is in that exam guideline is testable. It doesn't mean it didn't come before and it doesn't come again. So be very careful with that. Now we're moving on to more what we said earlier about reproductive strategies. We've done a bit of uh, reproduction in plants. We've done a bit of uh, life cycle in insects. We've done a question on uh, the, li uh, the life cycle in plants. Now we're looking at that last part that we mentioned, reproductive strategies in different organisms. And that brings us to question four. This one is talking about an egg. The following diagram represents a section through an amniotic egg. So clue given here, amniotic egg. So we are talking about an amniotic egg. You need to know the difference between the different types of eggs as well. So let's look at this diagram and let's tackle the question. The first one says, identify the membrane numbered one. We go to the diagram. Let's look at the diagram. There, they tell you that's a shell. Below that, there's something else there. Then there's another one here, another membrane there. And then there are two other membranes here, and there's a structure there. If you notice, the embryo is inside membrane number one. So we've looked at the diagram. We've analyzed that there are very many di uh, membranes in that diagram. The one that they're asking for is number one. And number one is the one that surrounds the embryo. And that would be? the amnion. Good. The amnion. The next question says, what fills the space between the developing embryo and the membrane mentioned in question 4.1 and what is its function? Now there's a couple of parts to that question. What is found inside this membrane that surrounds the embryo? Secondly, what is its function? If you know your diagram well, then you would know that in this diagram, in this area, there is fluid that is found there. And that fluid is obviously a watery fluid. And its function is to prevent injury to the embryo. So it acts as a shock absorber. Shock, let me get back there. A shock absorber. Because it's watery, it also allows for transport. And this transport could be that for food and waste. In other words, food going towards the embryo and waste going away from the embryo. So this watery medium, obviously, if something is suspended in water, then when it moves around, 
it won't hit against something. So the water acts as a shock absorber. And because water is a fluid medium, if something dissolves in the water, it can easily disperse throughout uh, the system. So it's easy for transport. Move on to the next question. Same diagram. Which number represents the Allen toys? State one function of the structure. So they want to know from you, in this diagram, what is the number of the Allen toys? So they're giving you the part now. Now they're asking you for the number. And at the same time, there's a second part to it. What is the function of this part? Now, you must be very careful here, guys. Sometimes many learners, they miss the second part. For some reason, when we put two things together, they miss the second part. And you must understand, we can't keep separating questions. We can't make it 4.1.1, uh, uh, where's the Allen toys? Or which one is the Allen toys? 4.1.2, now give its function. It will always, it, it can't always be that way. We can do it sometimes, but it becomes too monotonous to have so many questions when you want to ask one thing and we can put it together with the word and. You need to know that where does the word and, that means there's two parts to the question and you need to answer both. So which number represents that? When you go to the diagram, the Allen toys is obviously number three. So our answer is number three. And the function of the Allen toys in this structure is to store waste. It also has a function in respiration. That's the function of the Allen toys. So number three was the Allen toys. And this is the function that we have just mentioned. In other words, the fact that it stores waste and it has a function in cellular respiration. Good. We're moving on. Question four still. 4.4. Identify the membrane number two and state its function. This whole question had the word and, and it connected to, and always there were two marks. So you need to be very careful when you're answering a question like this. Remember, if there's an and, it means, obviously, that there are two parts to the system. What we want to know about number two. Number two is the membrane. Now watch where this membrane is. I told you earlier when we were looking at it, there's a shell. Just below the shell is the shell membrane running right around. Below that, there's another membrane. And this is the one that we are talking about now. Number two is this one here. It's the third membrane coming down there. And number two then is the chorion. Some people will say chorion. Some people will say chorion. I call it chorion. And state its function. Now, where's the chorion, guys? The chorion is outside the amnion, outside the Allen toys, outside the embryo, just below the shell membrane. And therefore, it is, its first function would be to protect. It must cover and protect. And also, the albumin, let me just put a dash there because you're going to get confused. You'll think that the, it's an explanation. In fact, let's take all of that out and let's go down. The one function was to protect. The second function, it allows food from the albumin to go through to the embryo. Now, while we're looking at this, guys, and we're not going to discuss it here, I'm just getting you to think at the back of your mind because you've done all this work before. This is a revision. We are revising. We are prepping you up so that you can write an exam. Now, when we're talking about these membranes, the chorion, we're talking about the amnion, we're talking about the Allen toys. Now, keep those membranes in your mind and compare the structure and function of the chorion the amnion and the Allen toys in the bird's egg, this egg that we are looking at, the amniotic egg, to those structures in the human body, the chorion, the Allen toys, the amnion. Keep that in mind so that when you get to that section, 
in the next segment of the revision. Uh, you must keep that in mind and you must draw in your mind a comparison. We do not have to draw a table every time to say, this is what happens here and this is what happens there. We teach you the one, we teach you the other one. It is up to you that if they ask you for the differences between the two, you draw from your bank. What is your bank? Your knowledge of this amniotic egg and your knowledge of human reproduction. You put these things together and when you put them together, you've got the differences. Nobody has to tell you that these are the differences. You know the work, you need to put it together. So be very careful when you're learning that as well. Still on this question, did internal or external fertilization occur to produce the structure in a diagram? The structure in a diagram is a bird's egg. And you know in that case it is internal fertilization. Explain the difference, 4.6 now, explain the difference between viviparous and oviparous embryo development. Viviparous and oviparous. The one that we just learned about, about the bird's egg, that is an example of an oviparous development. You and I, and many mammals, most mammals in fact, are viviparous. Now if you remember that, then already you understand the difference. Try to avoid swatting the difference and spitting it out in the exam because the spit doesn't look nice. And when it comes out, there's no direction in how the spit is going to come out. But if you understand it and you explain it in that answer book, it comes out nicely so somebody can understand it. So let's look at those two words. Oviparous. Generally, there is an egg with a shell which is laid in a nest or any other place, doesn't matter where it's laid, but it is laid, the egg is laid, and the parents then look after this egg until it hatches. And where is this hatching taking place? Outside the body. So let's put that in words. There is an egg that has a shell and it is laid. The parents take care of the egg till it hatches. That is oviparous. So let's go to that again. Internal fertilization takes place. An egg is formed. This egg has a hard outer covering, the shell in this case. All the nutrients and all the other stuff is inside this egg. And the egg is in no way connected to the parent. It is laid out of the body. The parent only looks after it. In other words, it makes sure no predators eat it up. It also keeps it warm. It keeps it in a safe place. And when the egg is ready, after its incubation period, uh, the young will hatch from this egg, oviparous. We move to viviparous. Here now, the embryo develops inside the body. And it receives nourishment from the mother and when it is ready the young is born alive there's no hatching that takes place the young comes out this young is alive and it gets all its nourishment through an area of connection between the mother known as the placenta. So in vervipari, the embryo develops inside the body of the mother. It's not laid anywhere. It's developing inside the body of the mother. Uh, this embryo is connected to the mother by way of a placenta. Now, obviously, as I told you earlier, now that we're talking about vervipari, you can link it again to human reproduction. And you can look at the functions of the placenta. It is not needed in this section, 
but we can draw our knowledge to compare what we're talking about, and we can compare notes in that way. So there is connection. Food is given. Nourishment is an all-encompassing term. Food from the mother to the developing embryo. And waste from the developing embryo is given out via the mother. Hence, when you do human reproduction, you will find that the Allen toys in a human is much reduced. The yolk sac in, an em uh, in, a, in a human embryo is much reduced. Why? Because the human is receiving his nourishment or her nourishment from the parent. There's no need for storing food. There's no need to store waste. It is given off immediately. Moving on, question 4.7 says, briefly explain the meaning of the terms. Which terms? Precocial young and altricial young. Sorry, there's an I missing there. Altricial young. Altricial. Okay? So we want to explain these two terminology. What are we talking about? When the young hatch or when the young are born, what is the story there? This is what we want to know. The word precocial young, to try to make you understand something to remember it by. Precocial, meaning to be forward in certain ways. Now, remember, do not write this in an exam. It does not mean to be forward. I'm using this as an example to explain something here. Precocial young, that when the young hatch, or are born, they are able to move and fend for themselves. Hence, I use the word precocious, precocial, precocious, to be precocious, to be forward. You know, when the girls will talk about it, they'll say, this one is very chachi. Yes, that's what we're talking about here. These organisms are ready to fend for themselves the minute they hatch or they are developed there. So they can do whatever they want. That means they can move everything they can do on their own. And altricial will be the opposite. So the young here are helpless and cannot fend for themselves. They cannot feed themselves. They cannot move on their own. They dependent on the parent. Very much like you and I. When we are born, we are totally helpless. If we were left to our own, we would wither, perish, and die. That is why in our development cycle, the degree of parental care is high. The parent has to invest a lot of their time and effort to make sure uh, that they get us to a stage where we become independent, we can feed ourselves, we can walk on our own, and we can take care of ourselves. So we are altricial. And some organisms, like some birds, etc., are precocial. So therefore, they are ready to do what they have to do when they hatch or they develop. Take a locust, for example. A locust, the, the, the female lays the eggs in the ground with her ovipositor. She covers it up and she goes away. There's no guarantee that she's going to come there. In fact, some textbooks say that when the female locust lays her eggs, she dies thereafter. So there's no mother coming back here. When the young locusts come out of the, the hole in which they were found. Then they take out the mucus plug and they push out from there and they come out. They can already move. They cannot fly, but they can move. They can hop and they can feed themselves. Nobody's going to feed them. So they were forward in that sense. Okay? So we say they are precocial and we are altricial. I've given you a whole lot of information there, guys, and I'm sure by now, you are nice and tired, or thirsty, or you want to go to the toilet. So without any further ado, I'll let you have your break. Welcome back, guys. I know the last 
break that you had was well deserved. So I'm hoping you took your time, you had what you needed to have, you revitalized, you are refocused, and now we are going to continue with what we have to do. And we move on to question five. Question five, and we go straight to 5.1. Discuss the importance of seeds as a food source. How are seeds important for us as fo for food? First of all, we know for a fact that seeds are important for food for animals, Ah, uh, let me get that spelling correct there. Eh? Animals and humans. Because animals and humans eat different types of seeds. We also know that certain cereals form the staple diet of various people. They feed mainly on the cereals that they find, and that is made up of the seeds of different plants. We also know that sorghum, sorghum is used in the beer making industry. And although we, we were mentioning this here, guys, it doesn't mean that to fill yourself, you need to drink a lot of beer. That's not what we're saying. Remember, there is some nutritional value in the alcohol itself because it has carbohydrate and so on. So obviously, there will be nutritional value. But you need to weigh the nutritional value with the negatives of it as well. And from there, you take your decision in terms of the use of alcohol. But it can be used to make beer. Okay? Sunflower and peanut seeds are used by many organisms. Obviously, these are the ways in which seeds are used as food. Now remember, birds, lots of birds, they depend a lot on eating seeds. Uh, they say that the seed itself has a lot of sustainable energy. So when they are flying for long distance, it's the seeds reserve energy that they have eaten that will carry them through in their journey. Lots of seeds like the nuts, etc., are filled with protein. And this protein can be used as a secondary source of energy. In other words, it's a stored energy. When it is needed, it can be converted to a primary source of energy. And this can then be used for cellular respiration. And the organism can sustain itself because of eating seeds. So definitely very healthy stuff in seeds. You'll notice when you're talking about sesame seeds, for example, those sweets that come in the form of a sesame seed, a very high energy boosting type of food you're getting from that. So make sure that you include in your diet some of these cereals, the nuts, etc., so that you can also get the necessary value from uh, the seeds that they're getting. Interesting point to talk about here also is here they're talking about the importance of seed as food. We must also be able to know in grade 12 the importance of seed banks. Why must we have a seed bank? No, 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 guys, don't get me wrong. We're not adding a new bank to South African Bank, Standard Bank, FNB. No, 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 you know the advert. So we're not talking about those banks now. A seed bank is an area where we keep seeds, we store seeds. So when we need those seeds, we can use it again. Now, why is this important? We hear every day of how many organisms are becoming extinct. So if we have a seed bank, then we keep the seeds of those organisms, of every organism that we know, of plants, that is, obviously. 
And when the time arises, when we find that this, this organism is being endangered, then we can use the seeds from the seed bank to propagate the same plants somewhere else so that the population can come up again. Also, when certain seeds are in short supply in certain areas, we can supply those areas with the seeds so they can sustain themselves with those kinds of plants as well. So seed banks are also an important resource that we need to use. Next question, 5.2. Name four types of stems that are organs of asexual reproduction and include an example of each. Now we're talking about asexual reproduction. And what they want to know specifically in plants and specifically in stems, not leaves, not roots, in stems. They want to know four examples of stems that can be used in asexual reproduction. Let's first list those four examples. The first one that comes to my mind is a rhizome. The next one that comes to my mind is a bulb. Another one that we can talk about is a stolon. Another one we can talk about is a Comb. And lastly, we can also talk about a tuber. These are five different types of stems that can be used for asexual reproduction. Let's give an example because the question said, and include an example of each. A rhizome, we can even talk of the fern. Bulb, we can talk of the onion or any other one, a tulip will also fit in there. Stolon, runner, running that way. And everywhere it, as it runs and along the length, buds develop there. And the best example for that, oh, my mouth waters when I talk about it, strawberry. The corn, we can talk of the ginger there. And the tuber is the most famous of all, and that would be the potato. And the potato, you can talk of a normal potato, or you can even talk of a sweet potato. This is the tuber. These are the examples of the different stems that we can have in asexual reproduction, and obviously their functions you can talk about as well. Most of these are underground storage organs that can help most of them, the rhizome, the uh, bulb, the comb, the tuber. They also serve as storage organ for food under the ground. Let's move on to 5.3. Tabulate the advantages and disadvantages between sexual and asexual reproduction. And the marks given 10. Uh, lots of marks for that. Let's see how we can fill in that table. I'm just going to draw a line running down there and a line running across there. And we write here sexual and asexual. Notice normally in the exams, when we ask a question like this, it would be odd number because the one mark would be given for you drawing the table completely. And some of the markers and some of the examiners, they insist that the table must be completely drawn. Even though your paper, your answer booklet has lines, you need to draw lines over that. So you need to do something like this, running across You need to have lines running that way there. Now, they want to know, first of all, the advantages and the disadvantages. So obviously, somewhere along the line, you're going to write the advantages. Advantages. And then you can do the disadvantage. It doesn't matter how you do it, but you can move it around in the way you wish to do it. You can do the advantages first and then the disadvantage or you can use an advantage which is a disadvantage for the other one. But I would prefer you doing it this way. You give the advantages first. Let's look at uh, sexual reproduction. What is the main advantage of sexual reproduction? Yes? 
No, 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 not what you're thinking. Not that. Take that thought off your mind, the advantage of sexual reproduction. We're not talking about fun, fun, fun. No, not that one. Skip that one. We are talking about for organisms in general. And that would be the main advantage of sexual reproduction is the fact that organisms would bring about variety. Because in sexual reproduction, there are two organisms involved, there is an exchange of gametes. Let's go back to the question. It says, tabulate the advantages and disadvantages. So we are doing that on the table now. So variety because there is exchange. Exchange of genetic material. So not only are you just saying the one thing about variety, but you're explaining how the variety comes about. An advantage of asexual reproduction, on the other hand, would be that because asexual reproduction does not require another partner, it is quick, less complicated, and ideal for large scale production. In other words, if we want to manufacture something, not manufacture is the wrong word, to produce some type of organisms in a quick uh, space of time, asexual reproduction is ideal for this because it happens quickly, they don't need a mate, they don't, there's no gestation period, pregnancy period, etc. Uh, no fertilization, all of that is negated, and therefore we, we can just go through this as quickly as possible. Also, in, a, in asexual reproduction, we can use it as an advantage here. What we use as an advantage there, we can also use as a, an advantage here. We can say that desirable characteristics characteristics could be passed on. Now let me explain that. It's one thing writing it down, but we must be able to explain it. What do we mean by this? Because you can say, but how, 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 do, how do we do this? Very easy, guys. Let's say we find one particular organism. Let's take we take a rose tree. We have a rose tree at home that is producing the most beautiful roses, the color of your choice, yellow, my wife's color. And let's say we take this rose and we want to make more of this. All we do is we take the stem of the rose, we, of the rose tree, we cut it carefully, we keep it in a nutrient medium, we then plant that carefully in soil, that particular one would become the same, would grow up to be the same as the adult. So what is happening? The desirable characteristic that I wanted, this yellow color, I am now propagating it somewhere else because there will be no interference. Whatever this parent plant had, uh, the offspring, we can't even call them offspring, the new plant will have because it is a cutting, a stem cutting of the adult. So that's how we can do the desirable story there, okay? Now let's look at some disadvantages. So you notice that there's a lot of discussion in this question. In sexual reproduction, disadvantages, obviously guys, because there's mating that's going to take place. Uh, sperms must get exchanged with eggs and so on. It's a complicated process. So it's complicated. One, it is slow. It takes long. Two, three, the organism has to find a mate. If there's no mate, this type of reproduction cannot take place. Good? And 
In the same token, what are the disadvantages for asexual reproduction? The first one that will come to mind is that there is no variety. Now, earlier we used that somewhat like an advantage. It can be an advantage where we want to take a desirable characteristic and we want to pass it on. But what happens in a particular generation if there's a weakness? Then that weakness would be passed on from generation to generation to generation. Because if this individual is weak, all the offshoots from that one, from asexual reproduction, would all have the same defect. So there's no variety. They're all the same. And you may argue, boring, boring, boring. This cannot be exciting if they're all the same. Imagine if you and I came from asexual reproduction. We would all look the same. I would be asking you, how are you, uh, Adam? And you'd say, Adam, I'm fine. And how are you, Adam? Because we look exactly the same. Imagine cops and crooks. The fingerprints would be the same because of asexual reproduction, because asexual reproduction is used for f making clones. So all organisms will be the same. So that is the disadvantage of asexual reproduction. This question says, briefly describe the differences between self-pollination and cross-pollination. Simple definition question. What is self-pollination? What is cross-pollination? So we just simply write it down. Self-pollination, when pollen, and we must, let's just start that again. When a ripe pollen is transferred to a receptive stigma, that means a ripe stigma, of the same flower, self, of the same flower, or, or another flower on the same parent plant. In other words, guys, what can happen here? We have a hermaphrodite flower. It has, like the example we did in question one, both the flowers were hermaphrodite in that they had both male and female parts. If the pollen from that same flower fell on the stigma in the same flower, self-pollination. That's easy. However, we extend it if we have one rose tree, and on this one rose tree, we have many rose flowers, then if the pollen from the one flower on the same tree falls on the, uh, 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 the pollen from the same tree falls on the stigma of another flower on the same tree, it's still self-pollination because it's the same genetic makeup. So this is self-pollination. And then cross-pollination then would mean Transfer, again, we have to say all of this again. Transfer of ripe pollen to a receptive stigma from a flower on one plant to a flower on another plant, but very important, of the same species. Very important. So now cross-pollination. I mean, guys, this word self, self must be the same. Cross between 
two different ones, very easy to understand, but we need to put it in words. When we're saying cross-pollination occurs, we can't just say from one flower to another flower, because if they were on the same plant, same tree, it's self-pollination stuff. It must be from another plant. In other words, in my rose garden, the tree that's in one part of the garden, the pollen goes to another tree, or in my peach trees, or my pomegranate trees, the the pollen from one flower on one tree goes to a flower on another tree. This is cross-pollination. It has moved from one plant to another plant. But my pomegranate pol uh, pollen cannot go and fertilize the rose pollen, uh, 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 rose eggs. That's not possible because they're not of the same species. Now notice how our work links up again. We have defined a species. A species is a group of organisms that share similar characteristics and can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. So, therefore, this falls in that because they can only uh, pollinate the same species. Once it's a different species, it will not happen because they are different species. So notice how your, your knowledge on speciation and your knowledge on the definition of a species comes into play here. They must be of the same species. And guys, that has brought us to the end of this session. I'm hoping that you have absorbed all that we tried to make you absorb in this section. Uh, remember, uh, these sections that we have discussed, each one of them are appearing on the exam guideline, so therefore you have to know it. With that, I sign off. All the best to you.